In the ecology unit, we looked at living organisms, how they behave on their own, how they behave when they interact with each other, and how they behave when they interact with their community. But living organisms are actually the end product of the processes that occur within their bodies. In order to understand how organisms work, you have to look at how they work on the inside. And that's where we're going to be focusing our attention. And we're going to begin that examination by looking at the most important compound in the world, water. Water is important not just because we of living organisms need to drink it, but because it is the basis for all the processes in our bodies. It allows our blood to flow because it's the main component of blood, and it allows our cells to function without overheating. In order to understand the cellular processes within our body, we need to understand that most important compound, water. This is Chapter 2, Properties of Water. To really understand water and the properties that it has, the first thing we're going to have to do is look at a little bit of chemistry. And we're going to look at the idea of electronegativity. Electronegativity is an atom's attraction for electrons, meaning that it's the strength an atom has to attract electrons belonging to other elements to itself. When those electrons are pulled in, you create a bond and you create a molecule. The stronger the electronegativity is that belongs to a particular atom, the stronger that atom is and the tighter those electrons are pulled in. All elements have a certain degree of electronegativity. The differences in that electronegativity will determine that the molecule is made if it's polar or if it's nonpolar. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the nonpolar molecule. In a nonpolar molecule, you have electrons that are shared equally among all of the atoms. So the overall charge is zero because everybody's sharing everybody's electrons equally. In a polar molecule, you have an unequal sharing, meaning that one atom gets the electrons more often than the other, and so one end is negative and the other end is positive. If you look at the polar molecule on the right, that's a water molecule, and you will see that the oxygen portion is negative and the hydrogen portion is positive. And that's because oxygen has a higher electronegativity. It pulls the hydrogen atoms, electrons closer to it, and so it gets to, in a sense, use them more often. So there's actually more electrons on that end of the molecule, and that's what makes water polar. Polar molecules have different properties than nonpolar molecules, and we'll talk about this extensively in this chapter. But what you need to know is that these properties will determine how cells grow, how they process their food, how they create energy, and how they let other molecules into and out of the cell itself. You're going to hear me talk a lot about the polarity of water. It's because this characteristic is what allows water to carry out all the different processes that we'll be talking about. It's also what allows cells to carry out their processes because the polarity of water reacts with the polarity of other molecules within a cell like the nutrients, like glucose. And those things together is what allows a cell to function, what allows a cell to live. If you look at the oxygen atom at the bottom, oxygen is much larger than hydrogen, and it has a larger electronegativity. Oxygen is 3.5, where hydrogen is 1. The difference between them, then, is about 1.5. That difference is what allows oxygen to be negative and hydrogen to be positive.
The difference in charges is what attracts other water atoms to each other. By doing so, that's how you end up with liquid water or solid water. If you didn't have that attraction between the water molecules, you would just have individual water molecules, but together they create something that's useful. Separate, they don't do anything for living organisms at all. Hydrogen bonds are what keep water molecules attached to each other. The hydrogen of one molecule is attracted to the oxygen of another because positive hydrogen is attracted to negative oxygen. This bond is the most important property of water. As I said, polarity is very important because water is polar and it determines what other molecules can be moved within the cell. But the hydrogen bond is itself extremely important because it's what bonds water together and it's what bonds water to other polar molecules. If you were asked on a test what is the most important thing about water, you would say its ability to form hydrogen bonds because that's what keeps water together and it's what it brings polar molecules into and out of the cell. And you would say polarity because it's that charge, again, that keeps the water molecules together and it's what brings polar molecules into and out of the cell. We've talked about the structure of water, so now we need to talk about the properties of water that are created because of that structure. The first is high specific heat. High specific heat means that water absorbs a great deal of heat energy before it begins to warm up. The same in reverse. It has to release a great deal of energy before it begins to cool down. This is because of the hydrogen bonds that we talked about previously. Heat must be absorbed to break the hydrogen bonds. The addition of heat to water causes a small change in the temperature because most of the energy that's absorbed is used to break the bonds. Once the bonds have broken, the water molecules can begin to move and temperature can begin to go up. The reverse is also true. Heat is released when new bonds are formed. So when the water temperature drops, the water molecules begin to move closer together, forming hydrogen bonds. That energy that is needed to hold the hydrogen bonds reduces the amount of heat that's released. I'm sorry, not reduces, increases. One more time. Okay, when the hydrogen bonds are formed, during the creation of ice, energy is released. The second thing is the high heat of vaporization. This is the amount of heat needed to change a liquid to a gas. Basically, it's how much energy is needed to turn liquid water into water vapor, not steam. Okay? We're talking about living organisms, so we're talking about evaporation. That's going to be different than steam. Living organisms don't have enough energy within them to make water go into steam. The process for the high heat of vaporization is the same as the high specific heat. You have to have a lot of energy to break the hydrogen bonds, to split that water into small enough molecules that they will actually turn into water vapor. So why is this important? Why do living organisms need these properties to survive? For the environment, this high specific heat and high heat of vaporization help to keep our environment stable in terms of temperature, meaning that we don't have 300 degrees during the day and negative 200 at night. We only go from, say, 100 in the desert to 50 at night. So that slow absorbing of energy and the slow releasing of energy keeps those temperatures moderate. You see this property most in areas like this where we're close to large bodies of water. Those large bodies of water absorb the heat 
during the day, and so it keeps temperatures mild, and then they slowly release it at night, again keeping those night temperatures mild. But it works everywhere because there's water in the air and there's water in the soil. The temperature extremes are just greater because there's less water involved. Inside a living organism, high specific heat is important because inside each cell is water. And that water absorbs the heat that's created as the cell processes its food, as it reproduces individual organelles within itself. And so a cell can use up a lot of energy, expend a lot of energy, create a lot of heat without itself overheating. High heat of vaporization does the same thing for the body as a whole. When you sweat, and that sweat then turns into water vapor, you cool off. And so the entire body is released of heat because so much energy is needed to create sweat, and then even more energy is needed to have that sweat turned into water vapor, cooling off the body. The third property that I want to talk about is the idea of ice and liquid water freezing into solid water. This is important because ice has two very unique properties. First, it's less dense than liquid water, and second, it expands as it freezes rather than contracts. Water is the only compound that expands rather than contracting. When water is a liquid, the molecules are able to get closer to each other because they're free to move. When it becomes a solid, the molecules actually form a lattice structure. In between bonded water molecules, you will find holes. Those holes increase the volume. Inside those holes, you will find air. Between the increase in volume the holes rather than molecules stuffed in there, and air, you have an increase in volume, which is the expansion I talked about, and a decrease in density. This is why ice floats on top of water. This is very important for aquatic animals because when winter comes, that means that the pond or the lake will freeze from the top down. The last property I want to cover is the fact that water is a good solvent, meaning that it will dissolve anything that is polar. Because water has such strong electronegativity, because it is so very polar, it will surround other polar molecules and basically pull them apart, pulling those electrons toward it. That's what makes polar molecules dissolve. This process doesn't work for nonpolar molecules because they have to have a charge to pull toward them in order for the water molecules to do their dissolving job. Nonpolar molecules don't have a charge, so water doesn't have anything to attach to. Oil, for example, is a nonpolar molecule, so the water can't make oil dissolve. That's why it floats on the top. What you find is that instead of dissolving a nonpolar molecule, it will actually organize it, meaning it will push them together. That's why when you pour oil on top of water, it creates those little bubbles that you see. There are two very important vocabulary words that you will need to know, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. A hydrophilic molecule is called a water-loving molecule. That's because it's a polar molecule that's attracted to water. Hydrophilic molecules have a positive end and a negative end because they're polar. They dissolve easily in water, and once they're broken apart, the water molecules will, in a sense, surround them, and that's what allows them to be distributed evenly 
through your water. So for example, Kool-Aid is a hydrophilic molecule. It's water loving, it's polar, and when you dissolve it in water, eventually you get a nice even mixture of Kool-Aid all the way throughout the container. Hydrophobic then is the opposite. This molecule is repelled by water. This molecule is nonpolar, like I said before, and so water can't attach to it. When you put a nonpolar molecule in water, what happens is the water molecules try to attach to it. They can't, so instead they attach to each other, and so those nonpolar molecules are pushed together. They're all clustered up together. That's called nonpolar exclusion. The nonpolar molecules have been excluded from the others. Both of these ideas of hydrophilic and hydrophobic are extremely important to living systems because they determine what molecules can get into a cell and what molecules can get out of a cell. Another very important property of water is the principle of cohesion. This is water attracted to water. You have the positive hydrogen end of one molecule attached to the negative oxygen end of the other molecule. When billions of these molecules are stuck together, you have cohesion. Cohesion is why water falls from the sky as raindrops rather than individual molecules, why water beads up on a freshly waxed car, why you can make water bulge up over the rim of a glass if you fill it really carefully. And it's what's even more important is cohesion is what allows water to flow rather than to plop out of a glass like milk that's gone bad. Cohesion also creates surface tension. And this also is extremely important, particularly for animals. Surface tension is created because the water molecules at the surface don't have other water molecules above them to bond with, so they bond even more strongly to the water molecules next to them and below them. And that creates surface tension. Surface tension is that skin that you feel if you touch the surface of a water very, very carefully. It's also what makes a belly flop so painful when you go into the pool. Animals have used surface tensions for thousands of years to allow them to move across water. I have a picture of a water skimmer right here, but I have a visual that I want you to see of a basilisk lizard. The last process I want to talk about is the idea of adhesion. Adhesion is polar molecules being attracted to water molecules. When we talked about hydrophilic molecules being dissolved, we were actually talking about adhesion. The polar Kool-Aid is attracted to the polar water. They adhere and then they dissolve. If you take a polar material like a t-shirt and you put it in water, it'll get wet. If you put a non-polar material like plastic in water, it won't get wet. In fact, the water will slide off. When adhesion and cohesion work together, you have capillary action. Capillary action is what allows water to move against the pull of gravity. So for instance, if you're talking about plants, it's what allows water and nutrients to move from the roots into the leaves. If you're talking about a paper towel, it's what allows paper towels to absorb water. It's what allows your coke to move up your straw. 
So if gravity is pulling down on the water, why does it still move up? So if we're talking about a paper towel, the water molecules' positive and negative charges are attracted to the positive and negative charges in the cellulose, the paper part of the paper towel. That causes the water to stick to the paper. The cohesion between the water molecules that are in the puddle push those water molecules from the bottom of the paper up. So it's like a crowd pushing you through a door. The water molecules at the bottom push together and push up. They push the water molecules that are already attached to the paper towel forward, and that's what makes the paper towel get wetter and wetter. This is the end of our chapter on water. The actual test will combine water with chapter 3, macromolecules.